Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It podcast. I am your host, Apostle Rosemary of RCN Ministries. Today, we also have my wonderful husband, Apostle Herbie, who is joining us on today. And today, we're going to talk about leading while bleeding. That is correct. Our subject on today will be leading while bleeding. We will be coming from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, as well as towards the end of this podcast today. We're also going to go over 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. We're going to look at this format um, of the text of the word, the word of God, and we're going to look at it in God, God's word translation, as well as the passion translation. When we begin to look at Hebrews chapter three, verses one through six, and I will read um, the passion translation and I will, um, I will turn it over to Apostle Herbie to start us out with God's word translation. And again, that's Hebrews chapter three, verses one through six. Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. So look carefully at Jesus, the apostle and chief priest about whom we make our declaration of faith. Jesus is faithful to God who appointed him in the same way that Moses was faithful when he served in God's house. Jesus deserved more praise than Moses in the same way that the builder of the house is praised more than the house. After all, every house has a builder, but the builder of everything is God. Will Spice say, Moses was a faithful servant in God's household. He told the people what God would say in the future. But Christ, but Christ is a faithful son in charge of God's household. We are his household if we continue to have courage and to be proud of the confidence we have. And that was God's Word translation read by our very own Apostle Herbie. I'm going to read it as well in the Passion Translation. And it reads Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And so, dear brothers and sisters, you are now made holy. And each one of you is invited to the feast of your heavenly calling. So fasten. Fasten your thoughts fully onto Jesus, whom we embrace as our apostle and king priest. Verse 2 says, he was faithful to the father who appointed him in the, in the same way that Moses was a model of faithfulness in what was entrusted to him. Verse 3 says, but Jesus is worthy to receive a much greater glory than Moses. For the one who builds a house deserves to be honored more than the house he builds. I want to stop right there, verses one through three, and we need to realize that we are dealing with the leadership. We are dealing with pastors. We are dealing with men and women of God who are laboring among us. And we have to give honor where honor is due. We need to realize that it's not the building, it's not the house, but it's the person who built the house. In other words, it's the builder. Who is the builder? The builder within the church context of this word, we are talking about identifying Jesus, the Christ, the, the apostle, my God. And we're understanding that he is the king priest in this text. So we understand here that we are to be faithful to the father. Why? Because Verse two tells us that he is the one who appointed him. That's why Christ was faithful to his father. We need to be able to understand that the model of being like Jesus and 
Being like God is to be faithful. The word of God says, if you be faithful over a few things, God will make us ruler over many. My God, we need to understand that when we look at this text and we begin to read here in verse four, it says every house is built by someone, but God is the designer and the builder of all things. We need to understand that even though we are men and women of God, we are pastors, we are shepherds, we're leaders, and we build the houses of God, and we build up the people of God through the word of God, the understanding, the knowledge, the wisdom, all of these things that are encompassed within who we are in God. We still need to understand that the glory and the all the glory and the glory alone belongs to God. It never belongs to us. We need to understand that God is the designer and the builder of all things. God has given us the ability to build the house. He's given us the ability to build up his people. He's given us the ability to walk out his will for our lives. Why? Because he has given us his spirit and his spirit leads, guides, and directs us in all things. Verse five says, and again, this is the passion translation. It reads in verse five, indeed, Moses served God faithfully and all he gave him to do. His work prophetically illustrates things that would later be spoken and fulfilled. If we just be faithful in this season, men and women, if we just keep our hands to the plow in this season, if we don't get weary while well doing in this season, God is going to bless us. He's going to bless you and he's going to bless I. He's going to bless all of us. Verse six says, but Christ is more than a servant. He was faithful as the son in charge of God's house. Remember, the church is his bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. So not only is he the Christ is that servant, but he was a faithful son and God gave him charge over his house. What is his house? The church. What is the church, the bridegroom? And now we are part of his house if we continue courageously to hold firmly to our bold confidence and our victorious hope, my Lord. Again, that is Hebrews chapter three, verses one through six. We have read God's word translation that was written by Apostle Herbie, and I have read the um, Passion Translation. We are going to move forward with this podcast. And when we are talking about leading while bleeding, uh, we need to understand what this means. Who are the bleeding leaders? Leading while bleeding means no matter what you're doing and no matter what you're going through, you keep pushing forward. Leading while bleeding means you must endure hardship, but you must still lead. Leading while bleeding means I know I'm going through in my body. I know I'm going through in my life. I know I'm going through in my finances. With the depth of the love ones, I must still keep pressing forward. Even in a time of great loss of a loved one, a family member, a friend, an associate, I've still got to lead. Even when we face adversities, we've still got to lead. We may be bleeding, but we're still leading. My God, I may be bleeding, leading while teaching. I may be leading turning hearts back to God, but still bleeding. I may be leading while preaching, but still bleeding. I may be prophesying while leading, but I'm still bleeding. I may be strategizing while leading, but I'm still bleeding. 
I may be afflicted like Job while leading, but I'm still bleeding. I'm still shedding blood. My flesh is still being torn. My God. That precious substance called blood is still gushing out while I press forward, while I keep pressing towards the mark of a higher calling in Christ Jesus. I'm bleeding, but I'm still leading. Even though we may be leading while bleeding, we're still pushing forward. We're not holding back. We're not getting stuck. We're still pouring out. We're still emptying ourselves of what God has placed in us. Why? Because there is a people that God has assigned us to. And there's someone waiting for you to arrive. There's someone, men and women, waiting for you to open your mouth. There's someone's life that depends on hearing your sound. There's someone that's laying in a bed of infirmity that's awaiting your sound to precede the move of God in their lives. We're going to look at some of the following statistics that I found within some articles that I've read on soul shepherding as well as leaders in ministry. I love to read, guys. I love to read. Um, so we're going to look at statistics on pastors. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Apostle Herbie. And we're just going to tag team and go back and forth. When we look at the statistics on pastors, there was a recent re uh, research that concluded while 90% feel honored to be pastors, 35% of the pastors battle depression. 28% of pastors are spiritually undernourished and 9% of pastors are burnt out. 23% are still distant to their families. They don't have that closeness, that oneness. A lot of pastors may not have that family support, my God, but they're still leading. That's a form of bleeding, men and women. Listen to us. Let's talk about the many pastors who should not even be pastors. Uh, who are these? These are the very ones that are looking for recognition. The very ones that are fast to run to the microphone without even considering the magnitude of the mantle in which they desire to flow in. They don't struggle with humility. They're not struggling with submission and obedience. They're struggling with platforms. They're struggling with notoriety. They're struggling with all these things. But there is a place of grace that we must find ourselves in. Leading while we're bleeding. There is so much that's going on in today's society that a lot of pastors are carrying heavy burdens. So let's talk about the unnecessary, overwhelming expectations of parishioners, which are church members, ministers, other men and women in ministry that literally are strangling out faith leaders. They're under pressure in this season. There's so much happening this is not the season to be quick to run for recognition, but this is the season to find a cave and get in the face of God. This is the season to find the floor and get at his feet. This is the season to say, God, crucify me. Crucify my flesh, God, that I live for you and you alone. Crucify my flesh, oh God, that I recognize who you are. And I realize, God, that I need you now more than ever before. Apostle Herbie's going to pick it up right here. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. 50% do not meet regulation with an accountability person or group. 85% have never taken a sabbatical. I want to touch on something Apostle was reading here. When we're, let's talk about the pastors. That's who he's talking about. 
when we begin to see that pastors, who do pastors go to? Who do pastors talk to? Where do they get their guidance? They get it from God, but there's something called a human touch, a human conversation from one faith leader to another. But who can they really call a friend? And that 50% he's talking about that meet regularly with an accountability person or a group, it does not matter the, the function, the five-fold ministerial function any of us walk in, but we need to understand that we still must be held accountable. We need a man or a woman of God that says, you know what, I, I, I know that, I, I know that I've, I've hit a level of ascension and elevation in my lives and in the things of God, but God, I need someone who's gone ahead and been that John the Baptist, someone that can hold me accountable, that when I when I look like I'm veering to the left or to the right, God, I need someone that can mentor me. I need someone that can pray for me. I need someone that can counsel me. I need someone who can speak into my life. And I need someone who can correct me and say, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. This is the, what the word of God is saying. Remember, none of us has arrived. We need that accountability, men and women of God in ministry. It is not biblical to say that we are under crisis covering. We're all under God's covering. We're all under crisis covering. But guess what? We have to be held accountable. How do I know that? Because Jesus was accountable to his heavenly father. Huh? Elisha was accountable to Elijah. My God, David was accountable to Saul. Timothy was accountable to Paul. My God, we can go on and on, men and women of God. It's not biblical. And the enemy is fooling some people. He's manipulating some people in this season that feel as though they don't need spiritual leaders. It's a form of witchcraft. Let's call it what it is. Because anytime the enemy can begin to twist the mind of the people of God and begin to have them to operate outside of the parameter of the word of God, it is not of God. Think about it. Let's talk about pastors needing a sabbatical, needing time off, needing to wind down. Needing to get at the feet of Jesus. Needing to allow God to pour back into them. Why? Because we've emptied ourselves out. And we need to be refilled. It's a dangerous thing for any leader to continually pour out when nothing's being poured in. Back to Apostle Herbie. Where do leaders go for help? when they are hurting do they have permission to disclose their pain when life happens and prayer is not enough are they permitting to tend to their well-being without it compromise their network can they escape the pressure to perform and live free from the demand of perfection Go ahead. Are they allowed to admit that their faith is also susceptible to fear? Do they have permission to stay, to say, I need help, I am hurting, I need time to heal? How do they live when the reality reality of who they are is enslaved to the expectation of others. Why are they scrambling to vice they teach others to avoid? Why are they leading while bleeding, drowning in their own blood, collapsing under the weight of the cross? They were means to represent, not replace Jesus. Now we need to understand something. 
<clears throat> Excuse me, everyone. I um my my sinuses are bothering me really bad, so you may hear me. And I apologize. We need to understand, as Apostle Herbie was asking us these questions, where do where do leaders turn when they're hurting? There are they able to really display their pain? And many are not. Why? Because it many see leaders as being weak when they're really being transparent. This is something that pushes a lot of leaders over the edge. There are so many leaders battling depression, oppression, suicide. Um, many take suicide as a way out because they're under so much pressure. And they don't have an escape. They don't have anyone to talk to. They don't have anyone that they can really um, open up to because then they people take their weakness and their transparency and they try to attempt to use it against them. Um, are they permitted to, 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 to do these things and reach out and, and transparency without people compromising? And saying they're they're you know a well we're, it's as if we're leading the pastor and the pastor's not leading us. I know it sounds crazy, but this is how some people think. Um, because if a pastor is transparent, if a pastor is someone who opens up, um, a lot of people will take that weakness as a sign of weakness, but at, when actually it is truly a sign of strength. Um, because I can be transparent enough to tell you that, that I have issues. I can be transparent enough to tell you that I bleed just like you bleed. I, I can be transparent enough to tell you that I weep like you weep. Uh, I can be transparent enough to tell you that I'm going through something and I just need someone to hear me. My God. Is there escape from the pressure and the demand on the pastor's life to perform? Because so many demand perfection from their leaders. Can a leader just admit that right now I'm a little susceptible to, to some fears or of, 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 of the unknown or, you know, God is leading me in a new direction. And, and, and it's really like the song Ocean, you know, where, where it talks about being led out on the water where my feet don't fail me. In other words, God, I need you to hold me up in the unfamiliar places. God, I need you to, to help me be as Peter and step out of the boat, but do not sink in the depths of the water. God, you're taking me to an unfamiliar place right now, God. God, I don't understand it as I ascend this mountain. But God, I'm going to step out on this water and I'm going to walk towards you. I'm not going to look to the left and I'm not going to look to the right. But God, I'm going to keep my eyes on you, God. God, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to where you are, God. Because I know in you is where I live and I breathe and I have my being. God, I'm coming to you, God. Because I know if you bid me to come, then you've already prepared you the way for me, God. Lord, you've already given me the faith to step out of this boat, God. So when we begin to understand pastors and leaders ah, that can say in transparency, I need help. I'm hurting. Uh, I, I need time to heal. I'm going through something. I've lost a loved one. Uh, I'm battling with some things in, in my body, some, some, some health issues or, or I'm battling with a family issue or I'm battling with an unsaved loved one. And, and, and I'm having to pray them through. But God, who's praying me through? So it means a lot when there are men and women that will stand up with leaders and say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. Uh, I'm interceding for you. Or just text you and encourage you. Pick up the phone and encourage you. And say, is there anything I can do for you? Not always pulling from them, but giving back to them. We need to understand that pastors are flesh and blood. Pastors break. Pastors get weary. Pastors get lonely. My God. Pastors suffer and go through just like you. How can they live within the parameters of everyone's reality 
being enslaved of the expectations of others, all while succumbing to the different vices that they teach others to avoid. Pastors are good at, at teaching and preaching and telling and, and showing and giving guidance to everybody else. But we're here today, Apostle Herbie and I are here today to tell you, pastors and leaders, they need help. They need guidance. They need all of those things as well. Here he was reading and he, he talked about leading while bleeding, while drowning in their own blood. So many are drowning in their own blood. They're collapsing. They're going under, under the weight of the cross that they've been having to carry. Uh, it was tailor-made for them. But guess what? Their cross is not our cross. A leader has to bear a cross and the heaviness and the weightiness of that cross. Uh, they've been graced for it. But every now and then, they may get weary. Every now and then, it may get heavier. Every now and then, they may want to collapse under the weight of it. Does not mean they're weak. It does not mean that they're not called to lead. But it means that I just need someone to pray for me. Help pray me through. Intercede for me. Because I'm dealing with something heavy right now that I can't carry. But the prayers of the righteous, the word of God says, availeth much. I just want to add this. In Ezekiel 16 and 6, it says, Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood. And as you lay there in your blood, I said to you, Leah, I've come here to tell somebody on today, according to Ezekiel 16 and 6, you may be bleeding while you're leading. Why? Because I'm leading, but I'm still bleeding. You may be kicking around in your own pool of blood, but I've come to tell you to live. I've come to tell you to live and live and have life more abundantly in Christ Jesus. I've come to tell you that it's not over until God says it's over. To get up to shake off the grave clothes and to begin to live abundantly even the more. I've come to tell you that it's not over. I've come to tell you that the end is not now. I've come to tell you to live, to thrive because you are alive in Christ Jesus. We're going to close this out with this scripture. And I'm going to click here and go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. And again, Apostle Herbie will read God's word and I will lead the Passion Translation. I will read that, excuse me. We wear ourselves out doing physical labor when people verbally abuse us. We bless them when people persecute us. We endure it. When our reputation are attacked, we remain cautious. Right now, we have become garbage in the eyes of the world and trash in the sight of all people. When we begin to look at this same text, and we begin to read this same text, in the Passion Translation, and it reads, talking about pastors, we work hard, toiling with our own hands. When people abuse and insult us, we respond with a blessing. And when they severely persecute, we endured it with patience. Verse 13 says, when we are slandered incessantly, we always answer gently, ready to reconcile. Even now, in the world's opinion, 
We are nothing but filth and the lowest scum. We need to understand, men and women of God, in this season, we will endure much hardship, but we will also endure the blessings of God. And we need to understand, men and women of God, that if God be for us, who can be against us? We need to just allow God to be God in our lives. And I just want to remind you, when we begin to understand, as the word has told us, and I want to read this in God's word translation as well, Ezekiel 16 and chapter 6 that I read earlier, it says, Then I went by you and saw you kicking around in your own blood, and I said to you, Live. Today, Apostle Herbie and I have come here to breathe upon you the fresh wind of God, to speak into your lives, and to say, You may be kicking around in your own blood. But God says, live. We thank you for joining us on today. We thank you for taking out the time. And we pray that this has been a blessing to you all. That you all have truly enjoyed this message on today. Leading while bleeding. We will be back here again next Wednesday at 6 a.m., ready to do this again, ready to pour out and just be obedient to the will of God through his word, leading by example, because God has anointed us and he has graced us to carry nations in our wombs and to birth forth global destinies. Again, I am Apostle Rosemary, of RCN Ministries and OSGA Apostolic Network, along with my husband, Apostle Hervey, and we are the Apostolic Overseers to One Sound Global Apostolic Network. God bless you and God keep you until next week, and we love you. Have a blessed day.